Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for today's discussion. My name is Mary Pat Dwyer, and I'm the Academic Program Director for Georgetown Law's Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy. And on behalf of the Institute, we're thrilled to be able to present perspectives on algorithmic accountability. Thanks to all who have joined us in person and online, and a particular thanks to Senator Ron Wyden. We're so grateful for your time and for your perspective on these important issues. Representative Clark is not able to join us today and sends her regrets. Today's event is part of a series that we host with the Yale Information Society Project. It is also co-sponsored by Georgetown's Global Tech Networking Group, a group of international academics and experts engaged in interdisciplinary research, dialogue, and scholarship on global tech law and policy, with a particular focus on elevating perspectives from and concerns of the global south. With that, I'll turn it over to Art for opening remarks. Thanks for having Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm Mark Pericles, I'm the Wikimedia Fellow at the Yale Information Society Project. We're excited to welcome all of you, and especially, uh, especially want to thank Senator Ron Wyden. Senator Ron Wyden, we, who really needs no introduction, uh, literally wrote the 26 words which created the internet, as Section 230 has been called, and he'll share his view for regulating AI, particularly in the algorithmic accountability bill, which he introduced with Senator Representatives Booker and uh, Clark. This is our first in-person event, but the series is now two years in the making, having covered all issues AI related. Uh, you can find all of our sessions at, on the Yale ISP website. Jim A. Arun, uh, Executive Director at the Yale Information Society Project, and Anu Conchander, Scott J. Cage and Ginsburg, Professor of Law and Technology here at Georgetown, who will ask questions. Uh, we'll then have an expert panel at 2 p.m. with the reception afterwards. Without further ado, please welcome, please join me in welcoming the Center of Wine. Uh, thank you. Keep, keep, keep in perspective uh, judgments like the 26 words that created the internet. Uh, my wife owns one of the country's great bookstores, Grand Bookstore in New York City, a third generation owner, and she heard me about this 26 words that created the internet around that time there were some news articles that said Ron Wyden and his co-author Chris Cox created a trillion dollars worth of wealth for the private economy. She looked at the article and she sniffed and said, you? <laughs> you created a trillion dollars worth of wealth? I haven't seen any of it. <laughs> She looked at the article and then she said, I don't know. I don't know if you that. <laughs> and she said, just goes to show that occasionally a blind squirrel can find an acorn. <laughs> Maybe in questions we're going to pick up on some of this. The topic you're looking at today, particularly fairness and effectiveness of AI, is critically uh, important right now. Big thanks. I gather this is a joint venture today, Georgetown and Yale, and uh, also uh, you should know that Representative uh, Clark is really one of the NBA all-stars of algorithm you know, policy. And she's been my partner now for years on algorithm you know, accountability. And you know, we really felt that that was the sort of crucial first step to shed some light here because you know, people, the algorithms, it sounds like so scientific, you know, there's this big word, algorithm, scientific, and we're always explaining, wait a minute, people are bringing their own biases and their own judgments into this. It's not quite how you might think. And now, obviously, you've got uh, chat GBT. It's on every reporter's little uh, automatic um, question when they're bombarding members of Congress on, on these issues. And, uh, you know, it's really time to scrutinize um, these tools. And there is a whole galaxy, I think it would be fair to say, of automated systems that the public can't see. And the fact is they impact a lot of people's lives. I mean, we are having this program on a Friday afternoon. And out all across the land, millions of Americans apply for jobs, they fill prescriptions, they're shopping for insurance, they're looking for housing online, and access to these kinds of critical services is often impacted by unregulated, unaudited 
algorithmic system. So to me, the first job of the Congress is to find out what these systems really are, create some baseline standards for transparency for consumers, and make sure that these black box systems really work. And uh, I just want to make sure that we don't have a bunch of automated systems that don't automate and also amplify discrimination. We've got plenty of discrimination already in the country. So, one of the first areas that I got involved in was the NFL concussion settlement debate. And the NFL was basically using a formula that would decide what kind of benefits that these retired players you know, would get. But the problem was, as we looked at it, and a bunch of the retired players started talking to our office. I was on a plane with one that said, hey, you're the for the Accountability Act. What do you think? And I said, well, I'm really worried that this thing the owners are using is assuming that all of you players, I went to school, by the way, on a basketball scholarship, dreaming of playing in the NBA. A ridiculous proposition. Six <laughs> four, I was too short, and I made up for it by being slow. <laughs> but I won, since we are a law school class, one important victory in terms of the law and religious pluralism. I I went to Cal Santa Barbara on scholarship, and I got an offer from Gonzaga, which is a really big basketball power, big deal school. And I actually joined the Cal, but I put the scholarship offer from Gonzaga up on the wall because even though I was never going to be a star player or get my NBA dream, I wanted history to show that a Jewish kid could play with the Jesuits. <laughs> so I care a lot about you know, fair treatment for athletes. And, you know, we looked at this and we got some good people. We recruit our our tech staff, those are those two wonderful folks over there. We recruit them like we we're recruiting Damian Lillard or LeBron James. <laughs> and it just looked to us like what the owners were doing was using a system that assumed black players had lower cognitive um, function than white players. So if that's the case, it means black players like are less likely to get the benefits, benefits that they deserve. So New York Times is writing about this. And after they raised a bunch of questions, I wrote the NFL letter. And it was kind of, oh, what's the deal here? Kind of letter. Is the NFL effectively denying black players settlement payments that they ought to be getting? And we weren't particularly subtle. We said, if that's what you're doing and we're concerned about, that's just textbook racism. So we asked them, the NFL, a bunch of questions um, about their formula, whether it was used to determine payouts, how many players got affected, and basically the NFL was stonewalling. You know, they wouldn't give us the kind of basic metrics and the stats and the numbers we needed. They basically dug questions, and these were not, you know, really... A surprising kind of question. We asked how many players didn't get benefits because of the formula? Where are the peer review studies that would suggest that this was an acceptable way to, uh, to proceed to measure whether a player suffered brain uh, impairment? So um, they didn't answer, but ultimately, the kind of pressure that we put on and my friend, Senator Cory Booker, I don't know, you have got any people from New Jersey in the house? Lucky, yeah. lucky you, you got to talk a good, couple of good senators, Cory Booker helping on this, and ultimately the NFL and the retired players agreed on a new way to give out benefits that didn't rely on the formula. So chalk up one victory, one victory, tangible kind of victory. And I think, Keith and guys, it's everything is still going through the appellate or whatever it is process. It's not final yet, is it? Almost fine. Almost fine. Almost fine. Okay. Anyway, a big step in the right direction. And, you know, it's not as complicated as a lot of stuff I know you all are looking at, but it illustrates enough about what we ought to be talking about, which is algorithmic fairness and effectiveness. So 
we started looking into AI and it was shocking about how many examples you find and how it goes back so long. In 2014, Amazon engineers set out to automate the process of recommending and hiring workers. Instead of having to hire the workers to sort through the application, they wanted a system that basically they could look at hundreds of resumes and recommend five people that we split. Amazon engineers used a database uh, of something like 10 years worth of resumes from people they had hired in the past. And then they cooked up a statistical model on the terms that appeared in the resumes. And after launching the system began to detect subtle clues that kept occurring on the successful applications. One big inference the system picked up is that Amazon hadn't hired many women over the previous 10 years. So instead of making the hiring process more fair, the algorithm was basically actively downranking applications that mentioned the word women or featured women's colleges. Engineers couldn't find a way to completely remove the influence of gender proxies that influenced the um, tool's outcomes. So in 2018, years into it, they basically said this tool got to go and they stopped using it. One last example we thought you would like is in 2021, journalists found that screening tools meant to identify patients who are high risk for prescription uh, painkillers were flagging cancer patients with legitimate prescriptions. What's more, journalists highlighted these algorithms were trained on very wide ranging uh, and sensitive healthcare data. So you got a system that is supposed to be flagging depression, trauma, and criminal records, all of which were more prevalent among women and racial minorities, you got one very alarming story on your hands. Each of these examples we bring up to show the extent of flawed automated systems that operate not in some science fiction novel that you buy at the airport, but in the real world. And the harms flowing from these kinds of examples could have been mitigated if the companies had been looking at the kinds of things that Congresswoman Clark and Senator Booker and myself and others are looking for. They'd be testing products for faulty data and bias and risks and performance gaps and the like. But we now know not very many companies have done a lot of work to make sure that their algorithms are working and are fair. And the government kind of makes it worse because neither the public nor the government knows what's really happening out there. So that's why Congresswoman Clark and I got out in the box in 2019 with the Algorithm Accountability Act. The act forces companies to perform ongoing assessments, what they need to do to take a hard look at the algorithms they use, identify you know, negative impacts in the systems, fix the problems, and that would include bias outcomes. But I mean, we're not using unusual kind of criteria. I mean, this is kind of, let's look at kind of bias 101 here. Let's look at these kind of checkpoints to make sure they're not embedded in the system. There's reporting to the FTC, called a new repository in the FTC, so consumers can see where the algorithms are going, where they're being used. And we're gonna push hard for the bill. There's new interest on the Hill now in algorithms. And uh, people wanna know whether they're a bunch of secret algorithms that decide if you're going to get to see a doctor or rent a house or get to go to a school. So uh, the bottom line in so much of our work, going back to Section 230, and for me, you know, Pippa Sopa and John Poindexter and the total information awareness 
society is just transparency and accountability. My wife accuses me of being fairly predictable in life. She said, we're older parents, said my husband likes to play basketball and drink chocolate. <laughs> when it comes to technology policy, you can almost set your clock by it. We're going to look at transparency. We're going to look at accountability. We're going to look at making sure that the government is not hampering innovation or First Amendment rights. So uh, it's time to set some rules for these decision systems that are playing you know, a big role in our world. And obviously, AI has sped things up. Um, in 2022, Representative Clark, as their Booker and I uh, updated the bill, we're looking at ways to update it some more. Um, we continue to watch for disturbing uh, trends. And just one last point that we wanted to touch on and then throw it open and softball questions will be especially welcome. <laughs> a lot more to do today. <laughs> the, the proliferation of AI-powered emotion detection tool or something I think everybody ought to say. Let's figure out here what's really going on. Because if you got systems that are saying we can determine things like a person's character, uh, their capabilities or their protected class status based on facial features, and eye movements, and tone of voice. My gut just tells me this is like in the ballpark of pseudo. So billions of dollars are still zooming into all this, uh, literally and figuratively. Zoom. Um, is developing tools that report, tell sales professionals how their targets are reacting to their sales pitches. Uh, Empath, another company, claims to be able to give employers a better sense of their employees' emotional state by listening to their calls. So you say, what's up with this? What, what are the implications here? Are we going to be looking at all this tech that wants to take you back to some kind of Victorian era when evaluating people based on their facial features or their shape of their heads with somehow, you know, the relevant measure? So um, scientists and people care about this, and I'm certainly going to do it when I have a chance. So I keep reminding everybody why junk science dropped from popularity in the first place. You don't want to go back to it. We'll be finally watching um, the European Union because they've got an omnibus AI act under consideration. See what they think of some of that. Um, last point, I guess I'd mention, and we know that there's a lot of promise here. And it makes sense that companies are investing these big sums and trying to find ways to integrate AI into popular products and services. But we want to make sure it's fair and ethical. And that's why you know, we're looking for examples. Um, Riff Clark and I wrote to Google in 2020 about firing members of the Google AI ethics team. In the case of Dr. Timnit Gabru, that was at least partially over a paper that he sought to publish about bias. And remember, when there is bias, who's going to get hurt you know, the most? It's going to be vulnerable people. It's going to be communities of color and indigenous communities. And uh, they're more likely to be harmed by bias and privacy violation. The companies ought to be doing more to emphasize diversity in their teams, which might also help to diminish these examples. And I don't think companies ought to be waiting until after a product is already in the market to get um, out to listening to those pers perspectives about people who are willing to speak truth to power you know, about um, technology. So uh, one of the rules that I've always had is Friends must not filibuster friends. And you all and, and professors and faculty have been really helpful to our 
little group we call ourselves kind of a guerrilla band. You know, we like go out and hunt down the issues and then we retreat to the mountains and kind of figure out how to how to do it. And then we come down and attack them at the angles. <laughs> but this is really an important time. And I'm glad you're doing this. I'm glad you're here from Representative Clark. I urge you to listen uh, to Senator, Senator Booker. Um, and uh, just thank you for having me. My mother would always go to Friday nights. So I was thinking my mom sure went to basketball games on Friday nights. I said, dear, make sure if you have Friday night, make sure you're running with the right crowd, looking out at all of you and your faculty. I know when I'm here. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Wyden. Uh, so in 1996, uh, despite what your wife says, uh, you helped create the modern internet through Section 230. Uh, so I would, uh, uh, it, so a statute that reduced liability for what you then called interactive computer services. Uh, that statute sought to reduce liabilities, but now you have offered a statute that tries to build in protections or guardrails from the outset for a new technology. Can you tell us your thinking that led to your approaches in both cases? Well, there were similarities and, and differences are obviously in a different times. Section 230 was particularly important because there were two court decisions that have could, they could have harmed the consumer internet in a very, very dramatic way. I was of the view that you know, if a small website platform got held, you know, personally liable for everything, you know, posted, nobody's going to give them any money. And I've always felt that powerful interests and special interests can come up with the money. So um, we wanted to get ahead of the consequence of those two uh, court, uh, court decisions. Uh, today, it's a little bit different. The court hasn't really gotten into this. And if you look at some of the questions that they asked or issues with respect to 230 uh, discussions, I think it's going to be a while before they get into AI because they're still learning 230 in the internet. Um, there's a need to write some ground rules, need to write some ground rules for AI. And uh, in 1996, I think we were able to read the handwriting that, you know, particularly people without power and clout. You know, people always say, oh, Ron, you're helping big tech. I go, baloney. Big tech can take care of itself. I, I care about people like Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement. You know, we've had people that's been associated with those kinds of grassroots efforts. I'm convinced that without some of the protection provided by 230, I don't think some of the Me Too folks would have a chance to be heard. I just don't think people would have. So we're going to take on all those celebrities and all those big shots and platforms and be vulnerable that way. So um, we've always cared about people without power, without political action committees. We're trying to innovate, we're taking on big interests. And uh, that's why. I want to make sure that algorithms aren't used today, 2023, to hurt those people, just as I was concerned about small users in, in the beginning. Always watch how an issue evolves over time, because very often the people who are big today often were kind of small. And when they were small, they sat in my office. I'm not going to use any names, but you can probably figure out a couple. <laughs> and they had just gone to J. Crew and bought one of those little sports jackets and red ties and <laughs> all the rest. Came in and read about how great I was. 230 was so great. And uh, they you know appreciated it. But then as they got big, they pulled up the moat because they had made it. They didn't care about the other people. And that's always been our, our focus. And there's a boatload of evidence now. The companies are putting out these flawed algorithm processes in between Americans and important decisions 
about making sure they get a fair shake in the American marketplace. So that, I think, probably a longer answer than you wanted, but there you are. Great. Shemai? Thank you, Senator, for your powerful work towards algorithmic accountability, um, especially in the context of bias. And thank you for explaining it so beautifully to us. Um, given the efforts that you have put towards this, I was wondering if you could say more about the greatest obstacles and challenges that you've run into in this path towards a greater degree of accountability, especially in the context of bias and discrimination. Well, I think the, the biggest challenge is the speed at which novel AI technologies are developing. And I work in a place Last time I looked, for all the rewards are for going slow. You know that old saying that the house is the people's branch and they bow to the will of the American people, but then things go to the prestigious United States Senate and the hot beverage will cool in the slaughter. It just gives me the creeps whenever I hear it. It sounds so damn slow. No, the world's speeding up, but not the old United States Senate. We're just chugging along. So I think that's really the biggest problem. And uh, this is a really funny story. Um, about part of our challenge. Apparently, one of my colleagues was approached by um, a constituent who said, you know, I've been watching the House of Representatives. And they were up all night and um, <clears throat> they had 15 votes to decide the speaker. I watched every, <clears throat> excuse me, watched every one of them. I watched every, <clears throat> I watched every one of them. And, uh, this seat man is really cool. <laughs> he says, when did seat man come in? And my colleague said, oh, it's been out there for a while, like since 1979. And this constituent said, that's really neat. I wish them well in their 44th season. <laughs> So you're dealing with performative kind of politics, politics that moves kind of glacially. I think that's one of the big challenges. Well, thank you very much, Senator Wyden. We really very much appreciate your leadership on the Hill um, and your kind of planning, you're creating the internet that we, uh, that we have today, but also you're thinking about the way that the internet should evolve over the next few decades. So thank you. It'll be an exciting time. I'm envious, you know. I I look out at all of you, and I I I see uh, a lot of people who are going to have a chance to shape some big big issues for uh, for the future. Are you guys three L or what? What year are most of you guys? Raise your hand if you're three L. Oh, <laughs> two, L's. two L's and one L's and one E's. What's a one E? Uh, evening students. Uh, so we have evening students, which are amazing. Like one of my, one of my former evening staff. students is here. Uh, Brittany is here, uh, and so. So when when does one of these E's ever sleep? <laughs> uh, not very often. It tends to work here at two p.m. <laughs> All right. Well, um, this is not an official Senate Finance Committee proceeding or anything like that. And I bet there are rules on this. But I'm just going to make a motion that our conversation be continued. Yes. And hearing no objection, <laughs> it is so ordered. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Um, my name is Mehtab. I am the program director of the Wikimedia Initiative at uh, the Yale Information Society Project. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here in person for this AI governance series, um, and I, we really enjoyed the you know the last discussion with Anupam and Chinmay and Senator Ron Wyden. So now we're going to be synthesizing what we heard and hear uh, you know our four expert uh, panelists 
talk about and respond to some of the uh, things that Senator Wyden uh, mentioned. So um, first I will introduce our, our esteemed panelists and then I will pose some questions to them. And then um, as we proceed through the discussion, we may have time for a few questions at the end from the audience. So uh, first we have uh, Nicholas Guggenberger, who is an assistant professor of law at the University of Houston Law Center. He, hold, he um, works on antitrust, law and technology, privacy and regulation, and he has frequently uh, advised government entities, uh, entities and served as an expert witness on technology policy, financial markets, regulation and media law. Uh, second, we have Kyoko Yoshinaga, who is a non-resident senior fellow at the Georgetown Institute for Technology, Law and Policy. Uh, Theoka's research focus has been on law and policy in um, information communication technologies and, and cybersecurity. Um, she has also been a researcher at the Mitsubishi Research Institute, which is a leading think tank, think tank in Tokyo, Japan. Um, we have Dennis Hirsch, who is a professor at the Ohio State University, where he holds a joint appointment with the Moritz College of Law and the Department of Computer Science. He's a core, core faculty member of the Translational Data Analytics Institute and is faculty director of the program on data governance, uh, data and governance, a program that focuses on law, policy, ethics, and management of advanced analytics and AI. Um, and last but not least, we have Paul Ohm, who is a professor of law at the Georgetown University Law Center. Um, he builds, uh, through his work, he builds bridges between computer science and law and utilizes his training and experience as a lawyer, policymaker, computer programmer, and network systems administrator. So um, I will pose the first question to Nick, since, you know, uh, Senator Wyden talked a lot about addressing the power gap between the people who are affected by the technologies and the, the bias and discrimination that they're susceptible to. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how uh, we should be addressing bias and discrimination. Just like a big picture introduction to the issues that we're going to be talking about today. Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction. I'm happy to solve that question with, uh, to solve that problem within the next two minutes. So um, <laughs> here, we, here we go. Um, I, undoubtedly, that's one of the core core issues that uh, I guess we face with the introduction of automated of automated systems is to establish mechanisms that don't perpetuate uh, that don't perpetuate systemic biases that are baked in societal structures. Now, um, there, there sort of there's within the within the bill that the senator um, is championing championing. There's certainly one thing that sticks out to me that I think is a crucial element, and that's um, agency building and institution building. Um, the bill alone uh, suggests to uh, add uh, 50 staff um, to the FTC. And if you take into consideration the overall size of the FTC with about around 1,100 employees at the moment, 1,150 or so, that's a significant increase for that specific purpose, meaning AI um, accountability. Now, the areas where I'm a little more skeptical of whether we are move sufficiently moving in the right direction. That's the approach taken or suggested by, by this act is to focus on, is to focus on self-assessments and um, following, following uh, holding companies to their self-assessments. And the reason why I'm a bit worried that whether that is sufficient to move into the right direction is the experience that we have in, in privacy, where we sort of followed this model by making uh, companies state privacy policies and then holding them at least to some extent to what uh, what they put out and what they've promised. Um, that's that's something where I'm why, why I'm why I'm a bit worried that this approach might might not do the trick. Now um, since you, since you asked me to solve the problem, I think the first step would be to identify where exactly the problem lies. And there is I think there, there are a few different interpretations that you could that you could apply to the example that the that you could apply to the example that the senator brought up with the um, algorithm that systemically suggested to um, hire male candidates. Um, one is to say, and that's probably the easiest one to fix, is to say, oh, this is a faulty algorithm. You know, there's just something in the algorithm that that's gone wrong and that that we can fix. Senator already pointed out that. Um, engineers sat down, tried to fix it. They weren't able to fix it. So either the Amazon engineers were just not like not well equipped or they should, should have done more research or whatever, but they weren't able to fix it. And um, it's also, it's, 
it, it would be like if it's just a, a, a flaw in the algorithm, it would be much, much easier to fix. Second problem is um, second um, I, um, analysis would be to say, oh, there's something wrong with the specific data that we put into the algorithm. We just need to sort of diversify the data set, or we just need to, we, we relied on the wrong data set, so to say. Again, that's an issue uh, that is probably harder to fix than just a flaw in the algorithm, because, I mean, we don't have those, in big air quotes, right data sets. So um, while still fixable, I'm not sure whether, whether that is the real problem. That leaves us with sort of a more structural analysis, and that that's the one that I think makes the problem much harder to fix. That is that these algorithms might not be faulty at all. Um, and that might sound weird, right? Because they're doing something that we obviously take issue with, but that they might not be faulty at all in the sense that they just point out the fact that, that, that Amazon for the past 10 years has structurally only hired men. And that's all that they point out. And in a sense, there's they're, they, they take the function of that Sort of the the, the naive um, young kid at home that says, "Oh, oh, um, oh, Dad, didn't you didn't you say last week that you don't really like that guest?" Um, and in that sense, they are just blurting out what is what is blatantly what is blatantly obvious, namely that there's a structural inequity. Now, if there's a structural inequity, and at the same time, if the algorithm just picks up on that uh, structural inequity, fumbling with the algorithm itself won't do the trick. What you would need to look at is you would need to look at structural. Uh, at structural remedies, and you would ultimately end up with a discussion with a very, very sort of politically controversial discussion around, well, at the end of the day, around hard quotas if you want to change the structure. Okay, with that, I'll hand off. Thank you uh, for that, Nick. Um, given us a lot to think about. Uh, I will tie some of what you talked about to uh, question from Keogo, um, and also about, you know, accountability uh, measures that are a burden on companies and how they respond. So you advise companies in Japan on development and use of AI specifically in hiring. And we talked about hiring with uh, Senator Biden as well. So you were in charge of risk management and compliance and making the products in-house. Um, so what are some of the things that companies need to do for, for better accountability? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I think the AI Accountability Act is an aspirational step for holding companies accountable. But there's a certain level of preparation that companies are going to have to put in to prepare um, themselves the steps to report to the government in order to comply with the act. I'd like to break my response down into what developers can do and what corporate end users can do to foster accountability. For example, from the developers, perspective, there are four key principles that they need to consider. First, companies do well to establish a code of conduct that covers AI ethics for employees and R&D guidelines with precise checklists, and to establish and publicize an AI policy. Some large Japanese corporations have developed their own AI policies based on these guidelines and published them online. For instance, Sony, Fujitsu, NEC, and NTT data. In R&D, it is important that the developers pay attention to the controllability of AI systems. Um, controllability is one of the principles set out in Japan's AI R&D um, principles. Second, they should follow these policies and guidelines um, strictly in developing their AI. A third, developers should not lock into a work in progress. They need to be responsive to any shortcomings of the system that need to be quickly reprogrammed. To this end, um, risk management and compliance teams should be um, involved from the onset of AI design. And this is especially important for the large development firms that have complex uh, bureaucratic uh, decision-making procedures. Fourth, development companies also should remain accountable to stakeholders. They should be prepared to explain how their AI has generated a given outcome, setting up a consultation service for AI production inquiries by client companies. Now, from the user company perspectives, um, there are three key principles that they need to consider. First, the AI clients, um, the human at the companies who use the tech, should always be responsible for the outcome and remain aware of their potential liability for damage uh, caused by their AI. 
The EU's GDPR, um, General Data Protection Regulation, also emphasizes the role of human intervention in automatic decision making, as do the Japanese Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications AI R&D guidelines. Both emphasize the human centric um, intervention or human centric nature of the field. For example, recruiters should not um, take the output of the AI for granted. It is humans who have the ultimate responsibility in decision making. This is as true for the user companies as it is for the developers. Second, although it might not be mandatory uh, for a company to disclose its use of AI to the general public, doing so is certainly um, the more responsible consumer-friendly strategy, especially in the case of recruitment. I, I say this knowing that many companies in Japan still hesitate to speak openly about their use of AI because there is still a lack of public trust in AI. In this sense, um, as you may know, the New York City Council's law requiring organizations to notify job candidates in New York City of the organization's intention to use algorithms in, in the hiring process, um, 10 business days before, they, before using the tool, um, can be seen as an effort at consumer protection, at least until the use of AI in hiring becomes more commonplace. Lastly, again, AI user companies should also set up a consultation service so that end users can easily inquire into factors that are being considered by the company's AI. Um, by doing all this, then the companies will be able to assess and report for the requirements of the AI Accountability Act. Thank you so much, Kiriko. Um, my next question is to Dennis, and it's related or you know another aspect to what Kiriko could talk about. So she mentioned her experience working with Japanese firms on AI accountability, and you have done broader research on how U.S. companies are, are pursuing or interpreting responsible AI management. So how does your research into U.S. firms relate to what is happening in Japan and generally about how companies respond? Sure. So we did one study in 2018 and 2019 on how firms were and we focused on the private sector how they were managing the risks and the own use of advanced analytics and AI created. We did both interview and survey-based research. And now we're doing a second study, kind of a follow-up uh, to see how the field has changed. And I think it's evolved a lot since then. And also to look at the value that these firms think they're getting from their investments in what they call responsible AI management or AI ethics management. Um, so that's our second project and we're partnering with the IAPP actually, who is helping to distribute our survey. Um, and I think that will be very helpful. So what are we learning? Um, we really looked at three things. What is this activity? What, what, what are they trying to achieve here? Um, why are they pursuing it? And uh, how are they pursuing it? So what we found was, you know, I was, I was interested, I had heard in, in about 2015, 2016 about data ethics. Um, companies were engaging in data ethics. I thought, what is that? Um, and I've always been interested in kind of the study of self-regulation, you know, why companies engage on it, what are its strengths, what are its weaknesses? So uh, we started to look at this, and what we found was that um, this was especially prevalent among organizations that were using advanced analytics and AI. They knew that these technologies were posing risks. The law had not yet caught up, it still hasn't caught up um, to regulate this. And so, and they knew that there could be some damage to them if they did not behave well here. Um, and so they started to try and manage this area. Um, and they're complex questions, like Senator Wyden mentioned um, emotional detection AI, right? And you think, ooh, yeah, I'm a privacy lawyer. That's, that's bad stuff. Uh, but there's actually a case study out there of a suicide prevention line that was using emotional detection AI to inform their call center people like what the emotional state was of the person they were talking to without adequately informing that person that they were going to be subject to emotional detection AI. So that's a privacy violation. But maybe you save lives. Is that the right thing to do? Is it not the right thing to do? I mean, these are difficult questions, you know, AI ethics. So, um, and, and they're being faced all over the place with respect to this very powerful new technology. 
So why were companies um, trying actively to manage this when the law didn't yet require them to do so? Number of reasons. Uh, one, they know that in the digital economy, they need data to, to, to do the, what they need, what they want to do. And if they are not trusted, they will not get people's data from users, they will not get data from business partners. Um, and, uh, and so trust and reputation is very important. This Amazon example, right? I hear it all the time. I use it. This is not good for Amazon, right? Um, so, you know, the Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, that was an unethical use of data analytics, right? It's, this has real impact. I think that was the wake up call. They've got a number of organizations focused on this. They want to prepare for the law that's coming, right? They see it. They want to design their systems to buy with it more cheaply than their competitors. They want to recruit and retain good employees, right? Especially data scientists, they can leave at the drop of a hat if the company is doing something that offends their values. That's a problem. They want to meet customer expectations. Customers want to be treated fairly, right? And to some extent, they want to put their corporate values. But I, I think the first reasons that I mentioned are really about their self-interest. Um, and that's the way to think about this with respect to companies. Not necessarily that they're being idealistic or ethical. They are pursuing their enlightened self-interest in the long term to sustain their reputations, get ready for, for the law, et cetera. Um, and, and so that's what we concluded is kind of motivating them here. And that's very similar to self-regulation in other contexts, which often takes place in the shadow of the law and the emerging law, right? Um, so uh, how are they doing this? Very briefly, um, and I can, if we have q and I can unpack it a little bit more there. But five main steps, top level commitment. The idea was like, you have to have the top leaders commit to this or nothing's gonna happen. Developing substantive standards to draw the line between what's ethical and what's not, what's appropriate and what's not, what's fair and what's not like in that emotional detection one. They're like, okay, we wanna be res responsible where we draw the line. That's a hard thing to do. Um, and, and high level AI ethics principles of justice and beneficence and all that doesn't really get you there. It's too broad, too, too, too subject to contestation. And, and so you need other ways of developing substantive standards. Putting in place a management structure around this. We, we saw the emergence in 2018 we, of one of the first data ethics officers. Um, that's more more uh, common now, responsible AI officers, there are organizations that have responsible AI teams, right? Um, and responsible AI committees that make these tough judgment calls about ethical issues. Not so much like the discrimination, I think everybody agrees that that's wrong, right? It needs to be addressed. But there's all kinds of other ways that you can harm people. Manipulation like Cambridge Analytica did, um, privacy invasions that, are counterbalanced with benefits, and how do you how do you make that kind of decision? Um, creating management processes, uh, how do you make these decisions? And then building a responsible AI culture. And one of the things we've heard them say is like nothing else happens unless you really build this into your culture. So um, this is what they say they are doing, what they are trying to do. We were talking to like the data ethics managers, right? And we heard from them, there's resistance within their own companies, right? Uh, and, so, and we also know that, um, you know, that their self-enlightened self-interest sometimes aligns with the public interest, but sometimes it doesn't, right? And, and they tend to act in self-interested ways in those contexts. So, I think this left us concluding that we definitely need law, we need regulation, but it should be a regulation that intelligently builds on what is happening out there, like what responsible AI management looks like today. And so I'm interested to talk more about Senator Wyden's bill and the you know um, algorithmic impact assessments, which are a management approach. They're, they're a management process, and I think it maps pretty well onto what we're seeing companies do. Thank you for that. Um, and, you know, it's interesting how both management processes and private initiatives will have to be incorporated or balanced out with what the law 
would require. And so diving to my question to Paul, um, since you spent last year serving um, as Special Assistant Attorney General for the state of Colorado, and you assisted in rulemaking processes for the Colorado Privacy Act. And um, we know you're limited in what you can say since you're still in active rulemaking, but what should we expect from Colorado and what does this say about you know, meaningful regulation of algorithms, you know, especially by states? Yeah, um, thank you. I, I, we are still in active rulemaking. I think it ends later this month. I don't think that's news. I think that's well known. Um, it's been eye-opening as an academic who spent his career kind of trying to find indirect ways to influence the laws, to look around this room and think, wait, what? You're trusting me with what? Um, and it wasn't me alone. I, there was a whole team and I was just part of it. I'm not speaking on their behalf. The attorney general felt wiser will disavow even knowing me. Um, based on <laughs> what I plan to say, no, I'm just kidding. Um, and, and, no, and, and, and so I'll say two things about this law and then I, I hope we have some time to react to one another. These have been really stimulating comments. Um, number one, you're all missing out by paying attention to California. California is an interesting state. It's a dynamic state. It's a massive economy. Um, it is one of two states in the country that both have a privacy statute and rulemaking authority. Colorado is the only other one. And so Colorado is the only one of the five states that have been enacted comprehensive privacy rules where the legislature was the final word and a bunch of experts got to come together to kind of add meat to the bones. And in so doing, I think, will largely be regarded as like really, really, really pushing what the statutes mean in other states as well. That's not our intent or our charge, but I think that's just going to be a fact. Companies are going to see our more detailed prescriptions and then they're going to kind of adhere to them. Um, and our statute, like most of these statutes, has a self-assessment requirement for certain types of what we call profiling. And the profiling has to be tied to certain adverse potential effects. And so that's a kind of really, really interesting piece of it. Um, and then it has an opt-out. So it has the kind of now sort of out of fashion, notice and choice user consent model uh, for profiling. And it was really interesting as kind of a rulemaking team to think about what do those words mean and what are we trying to accomplish with these? I'm skeptical, I have to say, of assessments and hearing my colleagues on this panel talk I think they've given us room to kind of have a little bit of hope for assessment, but to yearn for much more. Um, so that's one thing I'd say is pay attention to Colorado because, you know, we're one of two. Pay attention to us also because we have less bureaucracy than California. Like I talked to my colleagues from California and they say, you did what? You walked that down the hall and you did what? No, we've got to go through like 17 committees. So there's also a nimbleness, I think, in the kind of Colorado regime. What would I do instead of assessments if I were in charge? This is not part of the Colorado law. I think, especially when you're talking about large companies who, whose algorithmic decisions affect lots of people, you literally have no choice now but to kind of bring government to where it's never been before. You need to kind of blur the outer boundaries of the separation of public and private. I don't mean you nationalize Google, not yet. That'll come later. <laughs> but, but what I want is I want an empowered state official who sits within the company and is part of the company hierarchy that represents us, the people. Um, and so far more than an auditor or an assessment, which is this kind of routinized thing that happens in this very bland ceremonial way once a year, you just get to ask questions. You get to, you know, you have a keyboard and a monitor and you get to run queries on their database. And subject to kind of all sorts of ethical controls, you get to A-B test their users to see how they're responding to the systems that they're setting up. And of course, if you're gonna do that, you need to empower this person and you need to pay this person and you need to make sure that they're responsive and they're gonna be seen as probably outsiders within the company. So you have to deal with the kind of natural cultural implications of that. But I've seen audits like in a prior uh, role, I was a federal trade commission senior policy advisor for privacy a year after the consent decree with Facebook. I got to read the audits that came back. Now, this was all pre-Cambridge Analytica where apparently everything got turned up to 11, but I was not impressed by what I saw in the audits. They're really, they're really compliance exercises at that point. And so I worry that all this attention, in the algorithms debate to self-assessments and audits is probably more of the same. And it sounds like Dennis and Kyoko have like a lot of rich experience on exactly what those could mean and might mean. 
But I think if they're not involving the sort of kind of independent, free thinking person with access to everything, they're probably not doing enough. They really aren't. And so we need to kind of begin to blur these lines between them and us when it comes to question like this. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think I'll move backwards this time and go back to Dennis. And I was wondering if you could respond to this idea of having um, an empowered state official inside the company, since you did a lot of work on um, studying how companies are implementing measures and also how that ties into your uh, work on regulatory theory, whether there are you know, things from that that we can learn. Sure. So first, uh, I think that in two parts. The first, this idea of a government official it's empowered government official inside the company. First, what I like about it, it's like radical transparency, right? They can see the data, they can, you know, and, and so um, so I think that creates a lot of good incentives in a way. Um, what I think is, would be very difficult about it is these are, especially for large companies, and I think that's what you were talking about, not the small and mid-sized. They're complex and they have data analytics happening in many different business units. I don't know that even one person who was granted access could really see what's going on unless people bring it to them. And I kind of doubt that people are gonna bring it to them. Um, they're gonna be seen as an adversary inside perhaps. Um, and I think what you ultimately need is to build a responsible AI culture in the organization. Now, is that possible? How do you do it? Those are very valid questions. And, 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 and you know, but, but if I were to say, like, what would really work? You need the people on the front lines, like thinking about the spotting issues, fixing things, raising issues. And I'm not sure that a, a government supervisor inside the organization is gonna, is gonna generate that. Um, you asked me about kind of regulatory theories. So I've written about regulatory theory with respect to environmental law and policy. And, um, and I, I think it is applicable here and is applicable to the Algorithmic Accountability Act. And, and so when you think about regulatory theory, there's self-regulation. I'm going to put that on the side for a second. Um, and uh, and there's prohibitions, right? Like I'm going to put that on the side for a second too. But kind of standard government regulation really kind of breaks down into four types: design-based regulation, where the regulator specifies the controls, um, but does not specify the outcome; performance-based regulation, where the regulator specifies the outcome, but lets the regulated party figure out the controls to get there. Information-based regulation, which is really about requiring disclosure of information, hopefully, because that will then create an incentive to better live up to societal values, right? And management-based regulation, which is to require organizations to go through various management steps, planning steps. Um, and you see this in safe health, you know, worker safety regulation, environmental regulation. Um, the same basic kind of strategies, right? So what's interesting about um, the Wyden bill is it's, it's really management-based regulation and information-based regulation. It's certainly not design-based, right? It's not requiring certain controls or technologies, and it's not really performance-based. If you look at it, you know, it's not specifying performance levels. It says you have to assess whether you do this, but it's not saying what you have to achieve, right? And I think, and, and if you look at the New York law is similar, right? It's you have to do an audit, that's management-based regulation and you have to disclose it. It's not saying what you have to achieve, it's just, it's using transparency to create the right incentives. So that's interesting that this, uh, and, and the European uh, AI Act is largely management-based regulation too, you know, slightly different, but so, I'm seeing this kind of coalescing around a management-based approach to regulating AI and also an information-based approach. Um, because in the, the, the Wyden Act, you have to disclose the summaries of your algorithmic impact assessments. Okay, so I think that's appropriate actually. Um, management-based regulation and information-based regulation make sense where there is great heterogeneity among the regulated parties. 
because then one size fits all design standards don't work. They make sense when outcomes are hard and expensive to monitor um, because that limits where performance-based regulation can be effective. And they especially make sense when there's a, a large informational asymmetry between the regulated parties and the regulators as to like understanding the processes and understanding what can be done to achieve better social outcomes. And I think we really have that in this area. Like the, the, the tech is changing so fast to, you know, to really know what's going on, you need to kind of enlist the regulated parties and get them to manage um, and get them to spot issues. Um, so, uh, so, so I think that all indicate and, and get them to disclose what they're doing and what they're seeing, right? Information-based regulation so that you can reduce the information asymmetry and information-based regulation often can lead to more direct and vigorous regulation. Let's take environmental law, for example, the first major federal environmental statute was NEPA which was all about impact assessments, right? And generating information that can inform public discussion, inform later legislation. So that all kind of makes sense. Where I think that the, the, the Algorithmic Accountability Act falls short is that management-based regulation can be hollow if there are no performance standards that you have to achieve, right? You can set your bar very low and manage to that bar and still comply with it. So, and I... I don't think that performance standards are necessarily so expensive to measure and monitor in this area. I think it should be more possible. So it's something I'd like to see in the Wyden bill is a bit more attention to what are the substantive standards that these organizations should manage towards, not just requiring management. And I will contrast the Wyden bill with Senator Coons uh, uh, introduced in 2020, the Algorithmic Fairness Act, which calls requires companies to meet a fairness standard as defined in the FTC Act, they actually defines unfairness in Section 5N. That's a substantive standard. May not be the right standard, but it is a substantive standard. And uh, that act has not gotten much attention, um, but, but I think it's also worth looking at. Thank you, Dennis. That's a lot uh, to yeah. consider. I want to tie that to um, Teoko's um, experience working with companies in Japan. And I wonder if you could comment on like what kind of accountability you found to be helpful or should be pursued when it comes to addressing bias and discrimination specifically. Yes. So um, I really like the idea of empowers government official within the large company, like Paul said. Um, I think especially in a company, um, we start with the um, letter G, would be uh, very good <laughs> in that sense. Um, in Japan, it's kind of the other way around. Um, in Japan, uh, many um, major companies are actually involved in the rule of making process. Um, when we make like AI R&D guidelines, AI utilization guidelines, um, they're a member of these government ministries commission. So they're inclined to comply simply because as major companies, they may be, you know, they're involved in this rulemaking process. They have to comply with these you know, guidelines, even if they are non-binding guidelines. And if large companies do that, then in general, smaller organizations follow suit uh, once these large corporations adopt such guidelines. So, um, I expect that you know when com companies are required to be accountable and responsible for the outcome of AI's decision making as it is set out in this Accountability Act of 2022, I expect that it will mitigate those risks um, because these companies would start to care about how their AI models are perceived by the public. Um, however, um, so I was involved in this um, AI model making for. Um, hiring employment, but and I found out there were two um, factors um, that challenged efforts to mitigate bias in AI development and use. Um, first, um, unlike the usual corporate accountability metric, when it comes to algorithmic accountability, companies face special challenges where deep learning is involved. Um, deep learning makes it harder for users to predict 
outcomes. Although the AI Accountability Act of 2022 doesn't mention requiring companies to report on the reasoning of the algorithms, if the FTC will require that, it will put too great a burden on the developers. Even if you understand how your algorithms work, um, there may be trade secrets involved. So requiring the disclosure of algorithms will not go to some developers. Um, in Japan, when the cabinet office framed social principles of um, human-centric AI in 2019, they authored seven principles, including the principles of fairness, accountability, and transparency. They said that appropriate explanations should be given on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the application of AI in each particular situation, include, including such things as when AI is being used, how the AI data are obtained and used, and what measures have been taken to ensure the appropriateness of results obtained from AI operations. They didn't require reporting on the reasoning behind the decision-making. So I guess the company would just have to prove that the AI model was designed to factor in diversity and inclusion by diverse members and that it was audited by third parties. Um, the second point, uh, which would be my last point, um, of the difficulties in holding companies accountable in terms of like bias, um, lies in the nature of the hiring process in private companies. The hiring process has long lacked transparency. Uh, while organizations must comply with existing laws prohibiting discrimination, organizations, especially in the private sector, have significant latitude in hiring candidates they want. They have the freedom of whom to hire. So the hiring process itself has been a black box to some extent. Um, unconscious and conscious human bias will inevitably influence hiring outcomes to some degree. And critics of algorithm hiring system often state that AI models cannot be unbiased as they are created by humans using historical um, hiring outcomes that are themselves sensitive to bias. Um, while there are certainly challenges to developing unbiased models, I want to conclude by saying that there is an emerging path forward in which humans become sensitive to the presence of such judgment and data issues. Um, AI-powered hiring systems can foster transparency um, if humans understand how the systems arrive at their outcomes. Um, in this regard, you might have heard of explainable AI, which allows users to track the AI's selection criteria and weightings, and which provides insights into how AI-powered um, decisions are made is expected to play a role in facilitating the transparency and accountability of black box AI. So I have an optimistic view that if AI is made and used appropriately, it will mitigate you know, bias and allow for selection of candidates in a more fair and transparent way than when human recruiters sit through candidates on their own. Thank you, Carol. Um, I bring this discussion back to Nick, and I was wondering if you could both comment on what we've heard about different regulatory approaches and then tie it into the EU AI Act, which the Senator also mentioned, and whether there are elements there that you find are similar to what we've talked about or different, or you know, is there something in there that we're just not thinking about? Um, more than happy to give that a try. So um, on the um, on the suggestion that Paul, uh, that Paul shared about um, Having a government agent sit in, um, in in some function within a large corporation, I, I think there are at least two things that I really like about this um, proposal. One that I'm a bit more skeptical, I guess. One is the radical transparency approach. I think that's something that's that's crucial to um, that's that's crucial to any sort of regulation. Um, question is how to best do that. That will lead me to the last one. But before that, I think the second good or really valuable element about that is, is a step towards institution building. Um, uh, hiring more FTC staff is a step towards institution building. Um, designating, designating specific observers um, or um, or specific entities within government agencies that supervise specific large companies is a step towards institution building. So in, in that sense, uh, 
uh, I'm, I'm completely convinced. Um, I'm not so convinced about or with respect to the to this sort of system of incentives that we might be creating. And I'm kind of concerned about exactly the opposite of what's been mentioned before. So I, um, one of you was mentioning saying they, they would be perceived as outsiders or as um, adversaries. And that's actually something I would be wishing for. They should be outsiders of Google. Um, I see quite some danger that they um, being sent to Google, being almost perceived as being seconded to Google, having lunch with people, making friendships with people, becoming neighbors with people. That's not the type of environment um, that I think is conducive to like tough regulation. And so just imagine that person that's being sent from the FTC um, or whatever agency they would be sent from, they would be sitting with Google employees, they would be surrounded by Google employees, they would be having lunch with them. And the only, the single only difference between them and the Google employees is that the Google employees make four times the salary. Um, it's exactly, so So what, what does that do to the sort of incentive system at a very individual level? It basically just speeds up speeds up the the drive to get into the revolving door, right? And that's the concern that 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 I would have about about the, the suggestion. Now, switching gears towards um, regulatory styles and sort of parallels to the EU, um, I think one thing that we one might be able to learn from the EU is that tough sounding but management style regulation is not doesn't necessarily change much on the ground. And there two, uh, the GDP, uh, the new AI Act isn't even hasn't even become law, so it's very hard to judge what that's actually going to do. So let's look at what's the toughest EU regulation, the GDPR. Um, the GDPR largely follows this managerial approach as well, or compliance approach. Um, it has some substantive standards, but not too, not too many. There are some fairness standards in there that are vague. There are some standards that specifically impacted the EU. That's about the adequacy of um, data uh, data protection in foreign jurisdictions. When it's about foreign jurisdictions, then it's much easier to uh, to apply substantive standards than than it is at home. Um, but but uh, jo joking joking aside, on the ground. In terms of privacy and what's happening, not much has changed. Like the internet in Europe looks exactly the same, except that you click a few more few more boxes, um, and that you don't get to the website right away, but that you need that you take that you take a detour. And the rest, Google makes and Facebook make lots of money in Europe as well. There's 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 not that much. People might say, well, that increases compliance costs, and that's why the European startup sec sector is lagging. That's all true or could be true, but that's not necessarily something that like increases levels of data protection. Now, trying to, trying to tie that back means that I'm not really sure whether we have that good examples for regulation that achieves substantive goals via management, via establishing management structures. If there are some, well, great, let's build on them. I'm just, I'm, I'm, at least in the digital sector, I'm just not necessarily, not necessarily seeing them. Now, final word on the um, um, EU AI Act. The EU AI Act, um, I, I'm completely on board with, with, uh, with what you said about, and it's mainly, mainly, mainly managerial and mainly compliance, specifically with respect to systemic risks and the like. There's some standards in their respect to, um, um, relating to discrimination that, depending on how you understand the statutes and how they would be implemented by the regulatory authority, they might have substantive, they might have substantive con uh, content. And there's something that's interesting in there, and that's that the AI regulation in the EU tends to far overshoot what is caused by AI. So it tends to address harms that might be worthwhile addressing, packaging them in, in something related to AI, but, necess but not necessarily limiting itself to AI. And that's maybe something interesting to take away. away. So maybe AI um, regulation that has AI in its name can be a good vehicle to pursue more general, um, more general reform agendas. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so I want to bring the discussion to something the senator talked about, and then maybe we'll, and you know, no order for answers, feel free to jump in. Um, and then maybe we can get some audience questions. But um, the senator talked about how uh, Section 230 was, you know, the, the intention behind it was to protect the small user. 
And um, the AI Act also is motivated by this concern for people who don't have access to you know, lobbying and uh, uh, political action committees, and they don't have access to, you know, change the ways that they access services. They're pretty much at the mercy of the people making the decisions. So I wonder if the panelists could respond to um, the idea of recourse or the idea of public involvement or participation or some, uh, or in some form, you know, recognition that there's this individual who's at the receiving end um, of the decisions made by automated decision-making systems? And how are they going to be factored into the regulatory approaches you've all talked about? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, it, it, partly because it's in it, it gives me an opening to also respond to one thing that I heard from my co-panelists. Um, yeah, I thought that was a neat trick, right? I mean, Wyden must have had his staffers thinking, okay, I got a square 230 with this new act. Oh, it's small parties, right? And I'm not saying he's disingenuous. I actually think it's an exceedingly clever move. I mean, anyone who's been involved in legislation, you know it's always the like independent entrepreneur who you put out there, right? Or the Whether, children. Or the children. Or the children. Or the children. Yeah. Um, and so I thought that was clever. I mean, uh, uh, you know, you've turned this into an interesting question about remedies and recourse. And so this lets me respond to Dennis. Dennis, your framework is really useful and you have terminology I don't have. And I'm a huge fan of the design approach, which I think gets to your question, right? Which is, if we think about regulatory design as something that we're all doing together. And I was just talking to a bunch of our two L's, I see some of them in this room about how, you know, they're like 15 white men and seven zip codes in California who make the big decision. Uh, I guess there's some Asian men too, who make the big design decisions that dictate all of our lives. And all I wanna do is like expand that you know, a thousand or two thousand, and not just any two thousand. It shouldn't just be more elites, but it should be real opportunities for kind of participation. Okay, so now here's what I really want to say, which is the main argument you had against moving up your stack into performance and design is, oh my God, these corporations are so complex, right? And and that it's really hard to think about a performance standard or design standard due to the kind of intrinsic inherent complexity of these companies. That argument gets used a lot. And I just I just want to aggressively and fiercely say these companies are not that complex. There's a talking point in DC that, like, yeah, we've regulated, you know, pharma and the nuclear industry and railroads and all of these other industries. But for some reason, once you kind of have computers involved, and I think they're playing into the kind of average person and average policymakers kind of feeling of dumbness around information technology generally, and we believe this mythos that the IT is different. Right? Now, as someone who likes IT and thinks he's pretty good at it, I get to be on the other side. I think it's not that complicated. Like, sure, there's a lot of engineering, and there's a lot of kind of built-up cruft that would take a little time to unwind, but in many ways, like, not having to deal with atoms simplifies things, and, and I'm a very simple AI model. I think a panel was really successful for me, selfishly, if I have a new article idea. And so here's my new idea. I'm going to try it out on all of you. <laughs> it's, it's fun. As someone who's been writing art, uh, computer programs his entire life, I've been struck about the shift to artificial intelligence. And so for those of you who are coders, you're, I think going to know what I mean. For those who aren't, this might be new to you. It is such a different creative enterprise to write a computer program versus training a model. Training a model is soulless. Right? You write nine lines of code, you pump in a bunch of data, you look at the output, you see how it performs, and if it's not good enough, you like tweak a bunch of dials. Right? It, it reduces what is inherently this lovely creative act into you're just like working on a big machine and you're not quite sure how it works. Okay, so where does that cash out? I have this prediction that these tech companies are going to become less complex with the increasing reliance on algorithms. That they're instead of having these like super high paid Michelangelo's, right, painting this beautiful code, you have like a bunch of like middle paid data scientists who kind of just like turn dials all day. And so maybe even if today's companies are these like wonderkind complex beasts that we'll never understand, that may not be true. Like we might be heading to a bunch of things where like we just got a bunch of meat grinders and they take in a bunch of data and they put out a bunch of models. And if so, then it's a lot easier to regulate the heck out of them, to design the heck out of them, to set performance standards on them. And so 
the nice thing I like about articles like this is I'm just making an empirical prediction and time will tell if I'm right. But even if you believe this complexity myth today, I think it's about to go away. And I don't know if I've ever heard anyone say that before, but I'm going to try and write really quickly so you don't beat me too. Can I quickly respond? Sure. So first of all, I love that Paul is pushing back against the accepted wisdom. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, well, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's what you do. Good. 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 <laughs> um, I think you're wrong. <laughs> uh, oh, I love it. Yeah. Um, so because we're not just, first of all, I think these companies. Those studies like smokestacks and stuff are really complicated, right? I don't know that they're more complicated. I, I mean, there's there, there's there's it's coming out of the smokestack that you can measure, right? It, it's so in any event, um, I, I think I think what's happening inside these companies is complicated. It's 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 taking place in various places. It's hard to track it, um, and, and so I think you do need to actually involve the people on the ground. But more, oh, it's not just complex companies, it's a complex algorithmic economy. Like this is happening all over the place. And I do think it's evolving quickly, changing. Uh, and the regulators don't know, can't know enough about what's happening to, to really manage it. Um, and and that's, that's my take at least. But there's another feature to it, which is it's complex issues. Like this question of should we be losing emotional detection AI for suicide prevention calls, right? Um, or let's take another one. Should Facebook be trying to predict uh, whether people are at risk of suicide and do something about it? Is it ethical to do that? Is it ethical not to do it if they can do it? Is it, is it unethical not to do it, right? There's no code for that. That requires a human judgment. Um, and so again, I, so I don't, I don't know that 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 makes it simple where you can just kind of find a, a a technical fix. And the other thing I guess I would say is because it is happening all over the economy, the, the focus on Google, Facebook, it, they should be focused on. But this is happening hiring in all kinds of terms, small and, and medium-sized and even large firms that are not platforms. And so going back to the idea of like, a government person in the shop, I just don't think it scales um, to to regulate to regulate a couple of major platforms. Maybe to regulate an algorithmic economy, I don't I don't see how that could work. Can I have one quick reply? <laughs> really, really quick. I mean, what I want you to do is I, I, so I take all that. I want you to just be more skeptical about how self interested it is for these companies. Like I don't know if you've actually probe through their code to verify that it's complicated, or if you just believe people and their paid academic researchers who say, you will never understand this, right? It's just code. It's a, you know, I write code. It's not that complex. Sure, there's a lot of economic factors. And what you proved really well in your answer is, there's a lot of value judgments they have to make. Yeah. That is hard, yeah. complex. Yeah. But that's the stuff I really don't want them doing alone. I definitely want to be a, all of us at the table for that. As opposed to, we will never be able to wrap our arms around this machine. Right. You, you people who don't understand code, I, it's really not that. And so, I think you and I are in agreement yeah. that there should be a democratic process yeah. to inform those substantive standards. Um, and so, I, that's that makes sense. Yeah. Just, just adding quick, um, quick maybe parallel. I mean, one area in which we have seen the same claim made was the financial industry, especially pre pre two thousand eight. And it turns out that um, there are two, two, I think, two valid conclusions uh, that you could drive. Either the financial industry claimed to be too complex to be like regulated by the state out of out of self-interest, or they were too complex, and their complexity was the problem. And so um, there might be there might be a parallel to 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 draw from that with respect to large digital companies, which either they're right that that they're very complex, or it is just a marketing marketing claim. And if they're right, then we should question whether it's good that they're so that they're so complex. Now, I, I point taken about sort of algorithmic society and things that go beyond the firm, but within the firm, um, if we if we really establish that they're so complex that they can't be regulated and that they might still explode in whatever now that's figuratively, of course, um, then, um, then 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 exactly that might be the issue. 
Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. So, yes. So I'm, I'm as a Japanese. Um, I'm curious to know if like when companies in the U.S. are asked to do all these things from the government, they're likely to follow that. Um, because in Japan, if companies are asked to do something by the government, even under non-binding rules, um, there is a cultural practice that encourages them to comply. Um, not only you know that they're a member of rulemaking process, it just happens that way. Um, and um, also, so my idea is why don't you bring all these you know large companies, bring in them to the rulemaking process? Um, and then, you know, they won't, they cannot say no to the act that they're involved in. And also um, in terms of those, you know, emotional, um, you know, things that you mentioned um, causing privacy issues. Mm -hmm. I think um, the problem is that here, you know, in the US, you don't have the comprehensive privacy um, law yet. It's just the state levels that they're responding. And I know that the American Data Privacy Protection Act, ADPA, you know, came closest, the US has come to passing legislation. Um, but, you know, it still lacks comprehensive data protection law here. And that, um, okay. the first step may be to have the federal comprehensive data protection law and then start to work on these. AI accountability. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you to our panelists. And we want to open up um, to the audience for we have like a couple of minutes for questions. If anybody had any thoughts to share. Um and that's a microphone. I, I guess I have a microphone, but I can be talked around. Uh, a lot of the proposed acts somewhat assume that the organizations will be using the deploying these AI systems will have enough access to those systems to actually make these impact assessments. However, all the discussion today is really about all the stuff people are doing with ChatGPT, other open source models, things where you know you're not responsible for building the model, but you are responsible then for using it how you're implementing it. How would you propose regulators change some of the proposed acts to account for that kind of structure? What then what organization would do for their own governance, assuming that? Feel free to take the question. Yeah. What, what I really like about your question is that I think in the private sector, a lot of what is happening is companies are purchasing models and implementing them. They are not necessarily developing them. And I think when we think about this from a regulatory perspective, we tend to regulate as if they were developing their models, right? So, um, but I still think, you know, they're the purchasers, right? If you have transparency requirements where they have to, they, they too have to um, uh, assess, and, and, you know, they will, they will require the vendors to provide that to them. So it could work that way. It's a super interesting question. And I mean, it, it just goes to show you that I guess to support what Dennis has been saying the whole panel, like life moves really quickly, right? Um, and you know, there's now this magic pixie dust. You just put chat GPT in any old question, and suddenly it becomes a really hard question. I mean, I suppose it could be addressed, I think, as Dennis is suggesting, by kind of just broadening the focus on the actions and the verbs that you're using. And it's really not going to be chat GPT, it's going to be some kind of you know B2B purchase of the brains or the model itself. And so I don't see why you couldn't regulate that. It sort of starts to feel now I'm out of my depth with EU law, but you know, it sort of feels a little controller processor, maybe, right? But I, I wonder, but you're right, maybe that maybe this bill is already out of date, you know, because it predated what we all learned in the last six months. I like the control of the processor now. Much and easier. I think it's important to include them both. Yeah. Yeah. Um maybe we can pass the yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah, please go ahead. Hi. Um I have a question about like. You mentioned the role of legislature and expert body in shaping AI regulation. I want to ask about what do you think the role of the judicial branch should be in this process? I mean, it goes to, right, there's fundamental debates. Like Margot Kaminsky has this nice paper on binary governance where she talks about is your goal, am I going to get this right? Is your goal 
the vindication of individual rights or is it of like a, a broader societal goal like fairness? And, and what she really did usefully in that paper, she said, you're usually talking about one and not the other, and yet you conflate the two. And so when you're talking about vindication of individual rights, and some people don't think we should focus on that as much with AI, but judges are really good at that. I right? just have a good track record for ex post review of some harmful situation. And they're good at fact finding and they're really smart people, at least at the federal level. Sorry, state judges. Um, and so and so the, I think judges have a big role to play in kind of the harms that result, probably less than the kind of abstract institutional things we've been discussing here in this panel. Yeah. And even in bias, right? Don't forget, we, we've had discrimination law and judges play a role in that as well. And the judicial role, um, I think that you need to bring in AI expert um, when making decisions um, like you know, they do in the intellectual property area. Um, hi. I, so with context, I'm a washed-up data scientist in the tech sector that left to come to law school for the exact problem that was discussed. And my question, especially I guess relevant to Professor Hirsch, is I guess the point is that AI is fine if it's governed and used responsibly and ethically. Mm -hmm. And the problem that I experience in the field is that the CEO, CFO's office, and earnings reports are very close, while the ethics people are very far. Yeah. And when the way you want to use AI makes a lot of money, conflicts with ethics, the money has tended to win 10 out of 10 in the trenches. Right. And in the broader regulatory scheme, what, or what do you envision? As a, as a regulatory method to counter that kind of market dynamic that happened that each firms might grow like individual contributor level. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I think you're right, and I've seen some similar things. Uh, so I, I, you know, I think the responsible AI office is not going to be the most powerful voice, right? And so it, it, it has to have the backing of, 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 of the other powerful interests in the organization. So how do you get that? Um, I think ultimately this is another reason why we need regulation. Like that's a very powerful argument. Like we have to do this or, you know, we're going to get hammered, right? So um, then I, that's another way of kind of getting buy-in in the organization. Um, so I, I, I'm in favor of kind of a mix of, of, of strategies, right? So, um, but, but I think whether, you know, it could be management based with a enforcement penalty if you don't do it, right? Or transparency based with an enforcement penalty if you don't do it. That's part of what these responsible AI folks are trying to get others in the organization to do. Um, I think there's a role also for like the media, uh, you know, just reputation is key here. So like kind of, you know, they're, these organizations are responding to various pressures, media, regulatory. They're trying to figure out how do we manage this. So, um, so you know, again, I take the Cambridge Analytica example, right? It was a wake-up call. And I think that, you know, but you have to give these people the arguments to make. Um, I want to come back for a second to the judicial question. And one thing I actually like about that, I do think that in this fast changing area that's um, hard, that's that's rapidly evolving. It's hard to create rules uh, that will work over time. And that a good approach is um, case by case decision-making, which is to say adjudicative policy-making, not necessarily by judges, but by an agency like the FTC, and there's been, you know, written work about how the FTC enforcement decisions are kind of like a common law. And so I think common law, fact-based, case by case, like make a good decision and you build up a bunch of those precedents and you start to get some guidelines. And then, and then ultimately maybe you issue some, some, some general regulations. When you learn more, when you have already built up a bunch of precedents and, and, and a bunch of policies in that way. So, um, so I, I don't know whether it's judges or it's agency regulators, but I, I do kind of think a case-by-case -case approach 
adjudicative policy making as opposed to rulemaking is useful right now. Yeah, and let me add to that. Um, you mentioned the role of media. media. Yes. Um, in in Japan too. Um, so if there is a security breach um, under Personal Data Protection Act, um, companies are not punished right away. They the Personal Protection Commission will rec you know recommend or advise them what to do, and then if they don't follow that, then there will be like a punishment. But still, um, there was a huge uh, social sanction because media covered, you know, covers the security breach in a very um, uh, large way. So it will have a huge impact on these um, companies. So I think not only regulations, the role of media, and so and also the knowledge of general public. Uh, will also help in making you know, AI accountable society. I think we have time for one last question before we wrap up. I, uh, yeah, I already have the mic, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your perspectives on this. Um, I feel like um, ultimately some of the ensuring things that are done to ensure that algorithms that affect people directly are fair and accountable and could be done without special access to the systems under the hood. Like for example, um, you know, you can create artificial like dummy profiles and submit like requests for credit and then you know you can try to see you know if the race of the person actually affects it somehow potentially. But like some of it ultimately probably is going to require access to the entire workflow of getting the data, cleaning the data developing the AI, testing the AI, running the AI. And, you know, there are people inside big companies that are already doing this, right? Uh, they're just not required to report their findings to the public. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but to me, it seems like the only truly legitimate argument, other than it costs money to have the government do it, um, against requiring, like, full audits internally of companies that are training and running big AI systems like this is trade secrets. Like, and that was mentioned earlier. Right. I mean, if there's another one, let me know. But I think, you know, there's all other arguments that are less legitimate. For example, they don't want to be embarrassed, which doesn't that doesn't align with the public interest. But um, I just wonder if that means that we need to reevaluate the way we think about the priority we put on trade secrets, like socially or like as or or legally. And I, I wonder if you guys agree with that or what you think about that. And this is I, I, would, I just have a good, your, what your question made me think about something that I hadn't thought about before, which is um, first of all, I don't think the trade secrets is insurmountable because you can do things behind protections, et cetera, you know, in camera, whatever. Um, but do we want the government completely under the hood of a Google? Or does that lead you to a prison situation? Like Edward Snowden disclosed, I, I like I hadn't really thought about that. It's same one. I don't know what you mean. I mean, like <laughs> government getting access to all the data and the you know and and we, okay, this person is there for they're not national security agency, but it's government. So I don't. I, I just maybe there's ways to protect against that, but that's what occurred to me when you when you said it. Um, very common. I can't. Yeah. Can Hi, I, I'm an alumni. I'm Natasha Jordan. Um, do you know? I'm, I remember. It's good to see you. Yeah. Um, so, but the government already has all the information because you know uh, Thomson Reuters and Lexis uh, get all of this information both passively and actively from all sources, and then repackage it and sell it to you know the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and any, you know, any agency that wants it, and they do it in a customized way. And so I don't think that there's currently a barrier between data and government. I, 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, my understanding is like the Privacy Act against government from holding those databases, but they can outsource the processing to Alexis. But what I hear you saying is something else. The government can actually get and hold the databases, but I I would just be interested in seeing how the Privacy Act applies to that. Um, yeah, I would be interested as well. Yeah. Um, but in terms of how they how they get it is yeah. um, it works as a customized package, and so like 
they go to Thompson Reuters. Right. Thompson Reuters says, what, what would you like? Right. Here are all our like things. Like, right. We have, I don't know, uh, marijuana dispensary, database of marijuana dispensary owners. Right. Or like we have these like gas utility um, data combined yeah. with cell phone data, you know, right. it's all kinds of, and so, and then they bring it all together based on what the needs are. I think your broader point that there's a real blurring of government and private sector in this area, including through those types of arrangements, it's a very valid point. Well, we did one last question with the panel's permission. I just, um, this is connected to this. I just wanted to rephrase this question as hypothetically, if we did implement Professor Ohm's idea about having government presence in companies, I'm simply wondering how, what safeguards should we have in place to make sure that that doesn't lead to a situation where commercial surveillance and government surveillance interests get aligned and join both I, mean, I actually <laughs> agree with the last commenter that we're past that. I mean, if you look at the, and Ron Wyden is the champion trying to fight it. The Fourth Amendment is not for sale act. Uh, I was asked by the director of national intelligence to sit on a panel about the extent to which the intelligence community buys data and gets data. And I'm not allowed to talk about what I learned. <laughs> um, but, um, but this is a real problem. And don't get me wrong. I mean, my, that's too glib. Yeah, if, if we're going to build this system, you're going to wall that off. And there are cases where we have successfully walled it off, but they're few and far between. The, the will to fight terror is, you know, or claim to fight terror is too strong. So yes, you're right. This is exactly right. But it's the devil you know and the devil you don't, right? Like Google has those. Lots of other foreign governments have access to them, right? And so I don't feel, I only feel marginally worse if the FTC's like mid-level techie also has access to those. Um, I feel really bad if the FBI or the CIA or the NSA get a direct line into it. Yes, you're absolutely right about that. So we need to build a really, really robust wall. Thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. Please join me. Okay. <laughs>